Great, thank you. Thanks, Jenna. Welcome. Hi, good evening. This is the uh, presentation from the Vermont Institute of Community and International Involvement. Um, and we have uh, the good fortune tonight to be discussing. Oh, Sorry, Sorry, good night. I'll, 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 I'll see you in the morning. See you in the morning. We've had the good fortune to have uh, these Zoom sessions in which we hope to educate our community about important legal and constitutional issues that face all Americans at this point. We have with us tonight, Sarah George, who is the state's attorney, the elected state's attorney. She was elected in 2018. Is that correct, Sarah? I hope. Um, and she is what we are fortunate enough to have among us, a reform prosecutor. She's a graduate of Vermont Law School and she has served our community ever since in various ways. She was a deputy state's attorney under TJ Donovan, our current attorney general. And she, as I mentioned, was elected um, in 2018. And I believe we are very fortunate to have her in the state. I want to just say, um, I was a prosecutor for a while, about a million years ago. And I came to realize that when I was, that the prosecutor in our legal system has probably more power than any other single person. They decide what charges are brought and who goes to jail and for how long. That's pretty impressive. Anyway, so, but um, Sarah will be talking to us tonight about the ancient right of habeas corpus. And so with that, Sarah, this is Sarah. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. And hello, everybody. Um, I am gonna share my screen and um, do a, a little, oh, oh, I think I can now. A um, little PowerPoint just because I think it's a little easier to see that way. Um, all right. Can you yeah. see that? Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I don't know if you can see it with the notes page or not, but that's okay. Um, so habeas corpus is actually a, a, a federal writ, but it is it does have some equivalents in state court, which I'll talk about um, last. Um, but to start, it is this idea that everybody is born with liberty and that any taking of that liberty um, literally taking of that liberty by the government requires process and proof, which that is a writ of habeas corpus. It's, it reminds me whenever I hear that the phrase, I think about the show me the money um, from Jerry Maguire, like it is basically just the show me the proof where an individual who is being detained by the government can say, to a judge or to, to the community, you have to prove to me that you are legally detaining me. Um, it literally means let you have the body, but in context, it means that we, the court, are demanding that you, you have this body brought before us. You have this person that you are detaining and you need to bring them before me and you need to prove to me that you are legally detaining them. Um, so it's a recourse in law, which a person can report basically that they think they are being unlawfully detained or unlawfully imprisoned to a court and request that the court order the custodian of the person, bring them to court and determine whether or not they are being held lawfully. Usually the custodian of the person is either a sheriff in a lot of jurisdictions or here it would be the Department of Corrections or, or potentially the police department um, but the writ would go straight to the court and then that person would be brought before them. It is a guarantee against any detention that is forbidden by law, but it really doesn't necessarily protect any other criminal rights that an individual might have. So it, it doesn't protect an entitlement to a fair trial or being um, held on an amount of cash bail that you can't post those types of things. It is really just about whether or not you are being lawfully detained. And um, like, like any good writ or law, there are exceptions. Um, I'm just going to play this really quick two-minute video. I'm hopeful that you guys will be able to hear it just because I think it 
does a good job of describing these sort of exceptions. Can you see this, Sandy? No, not yet. Where would it be? Right there. Can anybody else see it? No, we're still seeing the screen that says habeas corpus mm -hmm. with the link oh. for a video. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm not sure how to fix that, and it will probably take too much time. So, um, it's just, it's a quick video that just describes what habeas corpus is, which I just told you, but then it also describes that like anything, there are some exceptions. And the main exceptions to habeas corpus is when the government has determined that you are an enemy combatant um, or a risk uh, to national security. And so um, the, the case that stands out to me on this issue, and it's one that we learned in law school, and it has always stood with me because um, it's it's like the only case I really remember regarding habeas corpus, um, mostly because it was timely. It's the case is Hamdi v. Rumsfeld, and the circumstances, as I recall them, are that um, this this man named this man Hamdi was born in the United States. I believe he was born in Louisiana, and he immediately within the first year of his life moved to Saudi Arabia. And then in 2001, he went to Afghanistan. He claims um, that he was in Afghanistan doing relief work, um, but it was during the US insurgency of Afghanistan. And he was taken into custody by US officials and brought back, well, not brought back, brought to Guantanamo Bay and he was detained and, invest and interrogated there. And he claimed a writ of habeas corpus. He said that, that I am a US citizen and I am being held unlawfully and you need to bring me before a judge. And the very first judge that heard it said, yes, that's, he's, he's right, he's a US citizen, you have to bring him before a judge, bring him to me. The government appealed it and the appellate court said, no, you don't have to bring him in front of a US, in front of a judge, he's being held as an enemy combatant. And they appealed, the family of Hamdi appealed that to the US Supreme Court. And the US Supreme Court did find that um, they should have brought him, that it did not matter what the circumstances were that he was being held on, that he was a US citizen and therefore should have been brought before a judge on a habeas corpus writ. So it ultimately was a good um, outcome, but the amount of time that he was held without ever seeing a judge, um, I believe was at least two, two years, if not more. Was it, was he in Cuba then? Was he at Guantanamo? Yes, yeah. mm -hmm. he was, yeah. Um, Can I so ask a question, yeah. Sarah? Yeah. All right. Because others that were held in Guantanamo were never brought before a judge, correct? That's and was correct. That, and was that because they were not citizens of the United States? That's correct. So those guys that were held in Guantanamo who were not U.S. citizens were never brought before a judge, correct? That's that's correct. I mean, I'm not sure if any of them ever were, but yeah. for the most part, that is exactly right. And um, the justification is based on the suspension clause. So it protects the liberty by protecting the privilege. So it provides that the federal government may not suspend this privilege except in extraordinary circumstances. So um, when a rebellion or invasion occurs and the public safety requires it. So we've had in every situation I'm aware of in Guantanamo Bay, the circumstance or the justification has been we are using the suspension clause, um, we are suspending the writ of habeas corpus because we believe this person is a national, national security risk um, mm -hmm. and or an enemy combatant and public safety requires it. Mm -hmm. So writ of habeas corpus is, is really a federal writ. And so in state courts where I'm working, um, and where most of us would 
you sort of hear about and see the impacts of the system, um, we don't really have that term. We don't really use um, writ of habeas corpus. Instead, um, the Vermont rules of criminal procedure have a somewhat equivalent um, in our rule three and rule four and rule five. And more particularly, when a person is arrested and they're arrested without a warrant and they're not released on a citation. So that person is arrested by a law enforcement officer and again, are actually taken into custody. So their liberty is being taken. Um, they shall be brought before the nearest judicial officer without unnecessary delay. Um, and not just brought before an office, a judicial officer, but they actually have to be brought before the officer with, an, with a formal information or affidavit um, from a, either a law enforcement officer or the state's attorney. And that is in some ways what we have kind of dubbed in, in our world as the 24 hour rule. So um, when someone's in custody on a criminal charge, a judge must find probable cause on the charge and that, that they're being held on within 24 hours of them being held on it. So an example of that may be that on a Friday night after court has closed and an individual is arrested by a police department in Chittenden County. And he's arrested on an allegation of aggravated assault. Um, he wouldn't be in court until Monday morning and that's more than 24 hours. So in order, and we wouldn't have technically charged the person until Monday. So in order to kind of, um, in order to satisfy the legal requirements, that law enforcement officer that arrested them or a state's attorney would have to call a judge over the weekend before that 24 hours. Um, I'm sorry, I keep saying 24 hour rule. It's a 48 hour rule. <laughs> There's a 24 hour rule, it's a 48 hour rule. Um, so within 48 hours, the the law enforcement officer or a state attorney would have to call a judge, tell them what the charge is, what the person's being held on, what our evidence is against that person, and ask whether the judge would find probable cause, whether they think that we have probable cause for that particular charge. And then if they say yes, that is usually noted either in the paperwork or the law enforcement officer might even include that in their affidavit. Um, when I first started, we used to actually have to fill out a form saying what judge, what charge, and when they found probable cause so that we could guarantee that um, probable cause was being found on those individuals that were being held over the weekend. Um, and the, the concern about this is that on a Friday night, say somebody gets held on a, a allegation of aggravated assault, and on Monday morning, we say that there isn't probable cause for that case that person's been held in jail all weekend on a charge that there was no probable cause for. So this is the way of having a second set of eyes, not just law enforcement, but somebody else, um, and really not just prosecutors either, but making sure that a judge has actually heard the evidence against the person and has found probable cause. Okay, so maybe, maybe, maybe you could explain what probable cause really is. Yeah, so that's the burden um, of proof that the state needs to show in order to charge somebody with a criminal charge. And the sort of easiest way to put it is that we have to show that it is more likely than not that an individual committed this crime. And the judge has to look at the evidence in the light most favorable to us, to the state. So even if there might be some evidence that tends to negate the guilt of the person being charged, the totality of the evidence and looking at it in our favor versus the person being charged, um, a judge can find probable cause if they think that we have met that burden. It's a really low burden. Um, for a lot of reasons, it's a really low burden. And especially, more likely than not is already a pretty low burden, but then when you take into account that a judge looks at it from the light most favorable to the state, that adds another element that makes it an even lower burden. 
um, because it essentially ignores um, or could, it could ignore evidence to the contrary. We of course try not to. Um, and, you know, at our office, we really try to look at most cases coming in, especially the more serious cases um, in, in a high, much higher burden, at a much higher burden. So in order to prove something at trial, you have to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt, which is the highest burden you can have in any country around the world. And so for us, looking at charging somebody with something that could completely impact, I mean, negatively impact their life, um, we try to make sure that we're actually looking at it more to make sure we can prove this at trial rather than just charging somebody because we can. We really wanna make sure we have the evidence to prove it. Mm -hmm. So I just thought it might be a good opportunity since we're talking about um, people being detained to talk a little bit about next steps in state court. So once somebody, once probable cause has been found by a judge, um, that person within a certain amount of time frame, it depends on the charges, um, will be brought in for an arraignment. And that's when the person will actually enter a formal plea. Um, more often than not, you know, 90 plus percent of the time, individuals will enter a not guilty plea. And I think that's really it's something that a lot of community members can get really hung up on, um, wondering how somebody who is maybe caught on surveillance camera doing or committing this particular offense, or maybe they admit to the cops that they that they um, did a, a did the crime, that they engaged in that behavior, how those people can then come in and on arraignment plead not guilty. Um, but the reason for that is that just because we might have the evidence to prove their guilt. Um, we still need to actually prove their guilt. Um, we need to make sure that their rights weren't violated. We need to make, and defense attorneys are gonna wanna make sure that, you know, the confession, for example, wasn't coerced by police or that police didn't um, plant evidence or, you know, make sure that all of their rights were fo followed in order to get any evidence from the person. And they also wanna make sure that whatever outcome um, that an individual is getting or a resolution that they might come to is based on all of the information. And that isn't often known at arraignment. We don't always have all the information right at arraignment. So it's actually very common that people will plead not guilty, even if there's an overwhelming amount of evidence against them. And that's, that's what our system is based on. We want to make sure that people are pleading guilty to things um, that not only they are guilty of, but also that none of their rights were violated in the process. <clears throat> so yeah, once they- Can I ask this quick, is all this based on the presumption of innocence? Yes. Okay. Every single person who comes into the courthouse is presumed innocent, um, no matter what the charge is against them. Um, an individual is never presumed guilty. They never should be presumed guilty. The constitution um, entitles them to the presumption of innocence up and until a verdict by a jury or they enter a guilty plea. So even at trial, when we've presented all of our evidence against an individual and the defense has put on their entire trial and we've rested our case and we've given our closing arguments, even in that moment, and in some ways, especially in that moment, that person is presumed innocent. So jurors are actually told when they go in to deliberate on a case that they need to start from that that they need to say this person is innocent and let's work backwards and figure out what the state did to prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt. So even all the way through deliberations that, that presumption of innocence stays with the person charged. So if they plead not guilty, um, then the next question is what, it, what are we going to do in terms of this person's release? So are we going to release them on their own recognizance, which just means you have entered not guilty on this charge and now you're free to go and you will have an export date and you have to come back, but you don't have any conditions, you don't have bail, um, you just have to show back up. The kind of, and that's the least restrictive possibility for somebody. <laughs> then the next 
least restrictive is that you, the judge does actually impose conditions of release. That can be anything from you have to come to court when you're told to, or if you change, if your address changes, you need to tell the court. Those are conditions of release, very minimal. It goes all the way up to you cannot be released until you show us a responsible adult that's going to take custody of you. Or you have to, you have a condition of release number 12, which is you cannot buy, have, or possess any alcohol while this case is pending. Or you cannot have any contact with a particular person, which is often the case in domestic violence cases or assaultive cases. Um, so there's a range of the conditions of release and the, the law requires judges to impose the least restrictive conditions that will still ensure public safety. Um, so that is, a, that is something that they are balancing all the time and trying to figure out what really is necessary to impose to protect the public. The next most restrictive is cash bail. <clears throat> and cash bail means that the judge finds that the person is a risk of flight um, and, and it can only be imposed if the person is found to be a risk of flight, which means that they either have prior failures to appear for court or that they maybe live out of state. Maybe they're in Vermont on vacation and they live in Hawaii and they have absolutely no intent on coming back to answer to their charges. Um, cash bail can be imposed under those circumstances and the amount is supposed to be based, a reasonable amount based on what that person can afford. Um, but the reality is that's, that's not usually taken into account. It's usually a pretty arbitrary number picked by the judge, um, usually based on the crime. And that person can only be released from the government's custody if they post that bail. So they give the government that money. And the idea behind it is that once they've given the government that money, they have an incentive to come back. Because if they don't come back, they don't get that money back. If they do come back and they plead out or they resolve their charge somehow, then they do get that money back. So the idea is that this money um, will keep people, they'll be released once they post that money and then they'll come back and resolve their case. Um, on that note, similar to a writ as well, if somebody is being held on cash bail and their circumstances change where they can't afford the cash bail or they're being held on a responsible adult condition and they don't have a responsible adult they can put forward, they can, re they can request a bail review. And they just need to file a motion that says, I want my bail reviewed. And the statute requires that a judge brings that person in front of them within 48 hours. So if they're taken very seriously when somebody says, basically, I'm being detained in a way that isn't fair to me and I can't do what you're asking of me or I can't post the bail you're asking of me and I want to get out of jail. Um, so they will file that motion and, and the court has to set it by statute within 48 hours. Mm -hmm. And then the most restrictive is called a hold without bail. And that is used very seldomly um, in the most extreme circumstances. And it's only, it is a public safety measure and it is for people who have committed a violent felony and the evidence of guilt is great. So it's not a probable cause in order to hold somebody without bail to be on that, we have to show that our evidence against this person that they committed a felony, a violent felony is great. And we don't think that any conditions of release can protect either the victim in this case or the public. And so those are really saved for um, ag like the aggravated domestic assault cases and aggravated sexual assault cases. Um, we had one today because we unfortunately had a homicide this past weekend. Um, and so I asked the court to hold this person without bail. So it doesn't matter how much money they have. It doesn't 
matter if they have some particular defense that they want to present. Um, none of that is taken into account. The only things that are taken into account is that it is a violent felony and our evidence that they did in fact commit the crime is great. Um, and they are held indefinitely. They are held in the, the life of the case. So um, again, it has nothing to do with how much money they're gonna post. Bail is not an option. They are just held in jail while the case um, is pending. Do, they, do you have to have any evidence of flight in that case or they're no. just held because are danger to the community? No? No. Nope. Um, well, danger to the community perhaps, but that could just mean one person. You know, yeah. if, if it is an aggravated domestic assault, you know, as a lot of us know, that person might not be a danger to anybody else in the community, right. but can be a fatal danger to the person that they have assaulted. And so we, we just need to show in those cases that the evidence of guilt is great and that a condition of release that they can't contact that person, for example, is not sufficient to right. protect that person. Um, the other aspect of a hold without bail, because it is taking that person's liberty, because it is, it is not about their money or the risk of flight, um, because they will be held in jail for months, potentially while their case is pending, an added safeguard to make sure that the government is not taking advantage of that is that the government is required to put on an evidentiary hearing within 10 days of the hold without bail motion. So for example, today, I filed a hold without bail motion for the individual who committed a homicide last weekend. And the court held him without bail until, the, until it's set for a hearing. So within seven to 10 days, the court will set that for an evidentiary hearing. And I will have to bring in witnesses to show the court, not just by affidavit, but actually show the court through witnesses that, that, that our evidence that this individual committed this homicide is great. Um, so it's an added safeguard to make sure that people aren't being held without bail, which is the greatest restriction on their liberty um, without multiple safeguards in place um, before doing so. It also, guarantees that the person go to trial within 60 days. Um, another safeguard to make sure people aren't just languishing in jail for a really long time. The kind of flip side to that is that the defense can waive that. And they often do because as you can imagine, a defense attorney will likely need more than 60 days to prepare for a homicide trial. So the safeguard is there, but it's rarely used. Um, we have multiple homicides, for example, pending in Chittenden County, and all of them are, except for this one we are in today, all of them are at least a year and a half old. And those wow. individuals are still, some of that's COVID, right? I mean, we haven't had, you know, we didn't have trials for over a year, but a lot of it is because the defense needs the time to adequately prepare the case. But does, the same part there. does the prosecutor need time also? We do, but the, you know, the statute doesn't protect us from that. Um, if we're not ready and the defense, you know, today the defense had said set this for trial in December, we would not be able to waive the 60 day rule uh, unless we were to revoke our motion for hold without bail. So you could, you could have more time if you were comfortable with that person being in the community. Um, you know, the, the thought behind that, I think, is that when a state, when the government brings a serious charge against somebody, they have all the evidence when they're arraigning the person. Um, but that's, again, unrealistic. We had this homicide this weekend, and there's still hundreds of hours of investigative work that law enforcement plan to do. Oh. Um, we've been working all day on gathering new evidence, and we'll continue to do so for weeks. So um, the, the thought that we would actually have all of this ready and wrapped up in a bow um, 48 hours after a person is, is killed is, is really unrealistic. Um, but it is usually the defense wanting that additional time. So, so the case you're involved in right now is a domestic violence situation? 
It is, yeah. It is a man who murdered his wife. Yeah, I think I read about it in the paper, actually. Yeah. yeah. Not great. Anyway. Okay, no. Sorry. No. Um, so those are the ways. Those those are actually, I don't want to say only ways because it, it it could potentially be a lot, but those are the ways that the government pre um, trial pre sentence um, can restrict somebody's liberties, and those are the ways that an individual can go in front of a judge and ask that um, it not continue. You know that they believe they have a right to be out and. Um, and make the, the state prove that. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to just see if there were any questions in the chat. I don't believe there were. No. One, Does anybody have any questions? Sarah, would, could you, do other uh, legal systems allow for habeas corpus, do you know? I mean, this is from the English uh, law tradition, right? So for instance, other jurisdictions don't even have a presumption of innocence. Could you explain when you actually have the presumption of guilt? Certain systems have that, correct? Yeah, I know that some do. I don't, I honestly don't know a lot about other, um, other countries. Well, why do we have a presumption of innocence? Well, I mean, it's, in my opinion, certainly yeah, the way it yeah. should be. Um, you know, an individual, again, when you're taking their liberty, liberty to the extent that we do, um, we should be held to a really high burden um, to prove that that person did it. Um, an individual should not have to immediately defend themselves against the government when the government is the one saying that they did it. Mm -hmm. um, on top of that, I think that the protections from law enforcement and prosecutorial misconduct are are, are gravely, um, well, they're they're needed. They're they're really really needed. There's a there's a lot of history around law enforcement and prosecutorial misconduct in again coercing confessions or planting evidence. And mm -hmm. if there isn't a high burden where somebody is presumed innocent, um, I think that communities and this happens anyway in the United States, given the way that the media, I think, portrays a lot of things as well. But um, without that high burden and an individual's presumed innocence, I think a lot of people would be convicted of crimes they didn't commit. Mm -hmm. now, but isn't it also true we're based on English common law and English common law has a presumption of, uh, has, um, has a presumption of innocence too? Is that yeah. true? That's true, yep, yeah. I know that I know that England does. I just don't know what other countries do. I know I recall being really surprised. Um, I, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but a, a um, man in South Africa who had who was alleged to have killed his wife, and it was a really public trial. Um, and I watched it, and I remember being so surprised that there wasn't a jury. Um, and that was the first time that I realized how many other countries don't have juries. Um, exactly. Their trials are decided by judges, mm -hmm. and Again, for better or worse, you know, I think that different countries have different processes and some have some really incredible um, protections of the person being charged. And I think some have, some are really failing uh, the people being charged. But yes, Jane, that is correct. Yeah, oh, oh, I was also thinking that thinking that, that, that sexual assault is a particularly difficult one, I, I mean, I mean difficult one because it seems to come up against people's val against people's values um is um the 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 quest that the case now about uh, i mean what that recently about a sex offender being released into the community without but without but but, but with the expectation that they could commit a crime again and being and, and having a person being unrehabilitated, going back into the community, seems to go against what the what what imprisonment is supposed what imprisonment is supposed to do. Well, and yeah, could 
comment on that, Sarah? That's. I guess I'm 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 a little unclear on the. I think Jane is uh, Jane is saying that the sex offender who was recently released. Um, oh. I, are you also saying, Jane, that you think he should have had some kind of presumption of innocence, or what? What is it that you're asking? Well, well, that well, that um, that that people are only supposed to be are people okay? Then maybe are people released from jail only when that they are presumed oh. that, 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 oh. that, that 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 they have that they have been sufficiently punished and yeah. that and that they um are not going to that and that they are not likely to commit again but this right. guy has it seems like they he 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 might he that that there's a that he could commit again commit again right. and how okay. i understand what you're saying jane um yeah, I mean, that is obviously always the goal of the system is to adequately hold somebody accountable and also rehabilitate them, rehabilitate them to the point of feeling secure that they won't commit further offenses. Um, my interpretation of that is that we do a lot of that wrong in the system currently because jail um, is actually an incredible, it can be an incredibly violent place. And so we're taking somebody who committed a violent offense and putting them in a violent um, air, you know, a violent atmosphere for years and years on end, and then completely stripping them of all of the community ties they have, obviously mm -hmm. employment, housing, children, relationships. And then when they do max out their sentence, we're throwing them back into a community and especially in sex offense cases, sending out a press release about when this person's getting out and where they're going to live and that they're a high risk of reoffense. Um, so we've had a lot of those press releases go out and then we hear that landlords that that person was going to rent to have pulled yeah. out of their agreements, the jobs that person had lined up had got those jobs taken away from them, um, the offers rescinded. Um, you know, so we are in a lot of ways, and I'm not saying communities shouldn't be aware of those things, but we set those people up for more failure by putting press releases out, telling people where they're gonna live, telling people all of these things about them that then often lead to our community um, kind of shunning them before they even get back into our community. And that's likely why most people will reoffend. So it's almost a, it's a little bit of a, a, short, a sword and a shield, I think, or a revolving door. Um, that we're setting people up for failure. But I also think that a lot of individuals will max out their sentence um, and there's not a lot you can do about that. You can't force somebody to get treatment um, as much as we'd like. Um, it's not often um, long-term. It doesn't often stick or work if it's forced. And so I don't know, there's a lot of those cases where an individual will just decide to sit out their entire sentence. And so they come out technically being deemed high risk because they didn't do the programming, um, but they may or may not actually be high risk. They've, you know, a lot of, a lot of the research will say that, that they've aged out of this particular conduct, whatever it might have been. Um, you know, they're coming out of jail often fairly old, much older than they went in um, and aren't as likely to reoffend, but if they didn't do treatment, we'll, we'll score really high on risk assessments. Um, so I think a lot of that needs to be worked on and a lot of that probably needs some different community responses um, and might have better outcomes. Sarah, that, I think Jane is asking about two parts of the criminal process. One, what you're talking about is prior to conviction, habeas corpus. Uh, right, right. yeah. And what Jane is talking about is after a person has been found guilty and sentenced. Yes. Right. So I think, Jane, that this whole idea of sentencing is really quite different. And once a person has fulfilled his sentence, he is entitled, he or she is entitled to become free again. Um, and that's not based on any kind of real rehabilitation. It's based on the fact that they served their time and now they're eligible to be free again correct? Right. right. Yeah. And, 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 and I would say, you know, I'll, people, 
So for example, I don't want to use this as a soapbox for restorative justice, but um, I am a huge advocate for restorative justice. And folks who go through that process um, are significantly less likely to reoffend, where people who are incarcerated for charges have a 64% chance of reoffending. And and we continue to send people to jail, hoping that that will keep our community safe, which it certainly does while they're in there, but it actually makes us a lot less safe when they come out because we're not protecting them in there. We're not rehabilitating in a way that really holds people accountable, um, in my opinion. So I just put that out there to say, there's obviously some people that need to go to jail for the crimes they've, they have committed. I, I I'm responsible for somebody being in jail today. And I, you know, I'm not saying that nobody should be in jail ever, um, but very few of our cases um, result in life without parole. Um, so I think we have 11 in Vermont, people who are serving life without parole sentences. Everybody else is coming back into this community. Right. And so we have a responsibility to make sure that they're coming back into the community, good community members, right? And not putting us all in more danger. But then that involves two ways to look at the correctional system, right? One, is the correctional system really for rehabilitation or is it for punishment? Which yeah. is, it, I mean, I, I'm asking that, I mean, what do you think? I mean, both or what? I mean, I think, I think the theory is that it's both, but the reality is that it's punishment right. oh, yeah. and only punishment. Robin, did you have a question? Yeah, um, I have a question about the uh, prison injustice uh, system. And in particular, I, I understanding that you uh, are part of a sort of wave of progressive mm -hmm. uh, uh, district attorneys. And uh, we saw che Chessie, Chessie uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, earlier and I just received a postcard about Larry Krasner, who is in oh, uh, yes. Philadelphia, Philadelphia. But <laughs> uh, this this is from prison radio and they're petitioning him that you should um, uh, you should not oppose his relief and uh, release. This guy did 38 years <laughs> in, in prison for a robbery where not a shot was formed and so on. So um, I'm I'm sort of surprised to get a card like that yeah. that I meant to mail in to Larry Krasner because I thought he was so progressive. Do you know, uh, I mean, I has the whole idea of letting people out who were unjustly incarcerated, ha is that movement really happening or is it just talk? No, it's really happening. And, and Larry is actually leading the way on it. So I don't know the facts of that specific case. I do know that when he entered office, he made a um, policy that his office would not contest any parole um, releases. Oh, wow. Not necessarily that he would go in and advocate for the release, which it sounds like that's what this postcard might be asking for. But in, in, Historically, their office and a lot of state's attorneys and district attorney's offices would actually go in and testify against somebody being released on parole, um, and his office won't do that. But he um, has exonerated since being in office more than any other state's attorney in the country um, combined. And um, I believe he's at 21 or 22 people who he's exonerated who are wrongfully convicted in Philadelphia. Um, and that doesn't even include the many, many more that he has resentenced to just had really, really extravagant, super long sentences imposed, and he has resentenced them. Wow. Um, Vermont doesn't have a great system for that. Mm -hmm. uh, there's actually, there are people serving sentences in Vermont that I would, I think should have less sentences. I think they were incredibly egregious sentences that they would never get now. We have one individual serving a life without parole who did not kill anybody. He was present at a homicide, um, but he did not commit the murder and the person who did committed suicide. Um, and so this individual went to trial and was found guilty um, as an acquaintance or um, as a uh, accomplice. Um, 
and I, you know, he was 22 years old when it, when it happened. God. So and I don't have a legal remedy um, to resentence him. And so a lot of states struggle with that. Why don't, is there no other way or he needs to get a, a lawyer to bring his case he's, forward again? No. He's got a lawyer and he has um, exhausted all legal remedies. The problem is he's, he's not being held. It's the sentence that it's a legal sentence. You know, there was nothing illegal done about it. In my opinion, it's just unjust. Um, so there isn't a great legal remedy to just resentence somebody for the sake of resentencing them. You really have to have like, they were wrongfully convicted or um, you have new evidence to support their innocence or, mm. you know, their attorney was incompetent, those types of things. There's a ton of legal remedies for those, but those don't apply necessarily when you just got a sentence that in my opinion, you shouldn't have got. Hmm. That's, tall, that's really sad. Yeah. So that should be passed by the legislature. Um, Yep, and we've tried for a couple of years now, and most of my counterparts have testified against it. And, and you know, the the argument against it is that victims deserve closure, right? Like when they when somebody is sentenced to something, victims deserve to know that that's the sentence. But my counter to that is that that's not really true anyway. Um, you know, the Stephen Burgoyne case I tried a couple of years ago. I'm still emailing the family on an every other week monthly basis telling them about the latest appeal and and how that might impact the case these cases never end um, and so victims really don't get the closure that i think we all hope they will when somebody's tried and sentenced can i ask another question about that sarah um victims don't have really legal rights anyway do they i mean i mean there's some but they don't they're yeah, I mean, they, they have a right to be heard, they have a right to notice, they have a right to speak um, at the sentencing, and they have a right to know, um, you know, when the case is being heard, those types of things. Right. But they don't have, it's not up to them, for example, what a sentence is. Right. They have input, and we are required to get input, but it's not ultimately up to them. And I think the reason for that is just to protect, you know, we could have somebody who wants somebody to get life without parole. Um, but maybe our evidence of guilt is not that great. And we need to take a sentence that's a little less than that in order to balance the safety, public safety interests with the risk of an acquittal at trial, those types of things. So um, we, we certainly take their input into account, but we have to ultimately think about the legal um, avenues and, and making sure that we're consistent amongst individuals that we're prosecuting. Does anyone have, have a question? Because I have another one. And uh, connected to that, but I don't want to be the only person that's chatting here. Anyone else? Okay, one of the things that struck me as a prosecutor was, first of all, the education I got when I was a prosecutor, that's for sure. But one of the things that I don't think people understand is the prosecutor actually represents all the people, correct? And that, right. includes, and that includes the defendant. That's and right. so, so as you can tell from the way Sarah has operated, is that she takes the defendant into account, which a lot of prosecutors do not. They think that they represent this thing called the state, which is not all of the people, but really is the police in a lot of ways, I found when I was a prosecutor. And in fact, the ethical responsibility of the prosecutor is to represent all the people and to make sure that the defendant's rights are respected, which I found really, really quite moving in a way. Um, anyway, and, and I yeah. know that Sarah does that also, so. Yeah, and I take that, I think, especially personal because I'm an elected official. So when I first started, I was a deputy state's attorney and I represented the state technically. But when you become the elected official, you know, the individuals who you're prosecuting, the witnesses, the victims, sometimes the cops, the judges, they're all your constituents. And right. so you really need to be able to balance all of the all of that input um, and try to make a decision that you know it's rare that everybody's happy um, with an outcome, and that's usually means you're probably doing something okay. But really making sure that ultimately that person that you're charging 
um, is going to be safer for the community when they when their charges resolve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. What else? What any further questions or discussions from you, Sarah? No, this is great. I love having these conversations. Okay, anyone else? So, um, well, the reason that I wanted to have this conversation was specifically about Guantanamo and, um, and ask once again, is the United States right now keeping people in jail before they're convicted of a crime? I mean, certainly, um, before, in yeah. other words, in other words, I've always seen habeas corpus as the as a right not to be disappeared, as so it happens exactly. in other legal systems. That's exactly right. Not, yeah. So that you don't languish forever in some location and never brought to trial, which of course is what happened with many of our detainees in Guantanamo. I'll ask you a specific case. What about the January 6th rioters? Are they in jail right now? Many of many them, of them are. Yes. What's that? What's going on with them? Why aren't they being brought in front of a judge? I think they are. I mean, I know that a couple just pled guilty. Um, I don't know in the beginning whether some of them were held without going in front of a judge, but I I do see headlines about some of them pleading guilty or having a hearing. Um, the people that I actually think a lot about is illegal immigrants yeah. being held at the border. Um, right for months, if not longer, um, with absolutely no legal representation, never going in front of a judge. Um, I think that those are an incredibly egregious violation of human rights Why laws. are they being held? They're being held in jails, correct? But they're immigration, um, immigration? They're not really jails, they're, they're just immigration. Centers. Centers, yeah, they're cages. Cages, children. Yeah. And that still is going on, right? It is. Yeah. So is it because there isn't a real crime involved in the first place? Why is this allowed? Yeah, I mean, I think that, again, I mean, it's, it is federal. Those are um, Homeland Security or immigration cases. Um, but yeah, they're not, they don't follow the same criminal Procedure. guidelines or rules, procedures that formal crimes do so is, can anything be done about it doesn't appear so right yeah i think biden could probably do a lot about it <laughs> you know i think our administration could do a lot about it and doesn't and don't yeah. so what's the purpose what is why what is what's really happening you don't know i mean i, I don't know i don't i mean there's a political answer i think but i i don't know the legalities of it um, well enough to know. Okay. But it's sad. Yeah. So basically, habeas corpus is a right, is really basically a right not to be detained um, without probable cause, correct? And then, in other words, and a judge has to rule that there right. was probable cause in order for that person to lose their liberty. That's correct. Yep. Okay. So, and I think it's probably pretty particular to the United States and England, but I'm not certain of that. Does anybody know? I don't know. Okay, any other questions for Sarah tonight? Um, uh, now how does have you, I'd like, yes, I'm sorry, it's Jane and, and, and Jane Henley again. Um, how does Hagius Corpus um, deal with, uh, deal with, deal with, deal with, deal with, with people who are, who are deemed mentally ill and and they and they're and they're losing their their I, their, the, their 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 liberty to their their liberty some um, sometimes against their against their will a lot of times a lot of times yeah, yeah. like involuntary hospitalizations jane is exactly. that yeah yeah exactly yeah i mean there is a that does happen certainly um but there is a judge involved in that process there has to be a judge involved in that mm -hmm. process um pretty quickly so i believe it's seven there's there are 72 hour holds which um don't i don't always require a judge it can sometimes just require a, a treating physician if law enforcement 
wants to do an involuntary hospitalization, um, that does require usually a prosecutor from my office um, to call a judge and get and get a court order for that. But after that 72 hours, if the hospital wants to continue to hold somebody without um, permission or involuntarily, they do have to go in front of a judge. Um, so not to minimize 72 hours, um, 72 hours being held against your will is a, a long time, um, but it isn't, you know, the idea behind habeas was really people who were being held for months um, and, and more um, without ever being brought in front of a judge. That because I was no because the reason that I was thinking in those terms was I was, I was thinking of of these unrepentant rapists as as having some type of mental a type of mental illness because if they if they're if they're refusing treatment, it would be almost um and but but they but there's a high likelihood of them committing a crime, then are they? It's it's almost yeah they think they. That, that 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 almost like them having 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 a type of mental illness uh, almost like mm -hmm. having a type of men mental illness um but anyways it, it's it's a yeah. that's a weird but that's an odd way of thinking about it it's mm -hmm. it's 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 tr it's tr it's troubling um, yeah it is troubling and i i think that you know, there's certainly folks that I have spoke with who were in on sex offense, sex offenses and refused the programming. Um, and that was mostly because some of the programs require that you admit every single fact in the affidavit in order to succeed in the programming. And the reality is that that's not often the case, right? It's, and so a lot of individuals will just say like, yes, I committed this offense, but I did not do that or that or that or that and that will cause them to fail the programming so some of it i really do think is a programming issue and the way that we gauge success and rehabilitation of incarcerated mm -hmm. folks rather than an individual just refusing to do this programming because they don't want to do the programming um it's usually why a lot of people are not released at their minimums because they um, haven't done the programming. So there is a huge incentive for folks to do it. And if they don't, or they aren't successful, it's not always because they're going to reoffend. Um, it can just be out of principle that they will not admit to something they say didn't happen, even if they'll ultimately admit they committed the sexual, sexual assault, which to me seems like it should be the priority in any programming that you don't make them admit every single thing. You focus on the most important things and you go forward, but that's not always the case. And that's why we're lucky to have Sarah George as state's attorney. Um, anyway, we're, I think we're out of time. Thank you all for joining. And again, this will be recorded and be on CCTV. Uh, I wanna thank you all for attending. And next week we're having a discussion with a public defender from Florida a former student of mine at Burlington College where she'll be discussing the death penalty and she's in a state which has the death penalty. So yeah, uses it. Right. So we will talk next week, I hope. And thank you, Sarah and everyone Great. else for joining thank us. Thank you all. Sarah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye.